Okay, right. So, the ANREP effect now. We've seen the Frank-Starling law. Let's now look at the ANREP effect. So, the Frank-Starling law comes into play very, very quickly. If you get an increase in end diastolic volume in the left ventricle, then this will happen instantly. There's nothing time-consuming about this. The instant you stretch the, uh, the walls of the heart, and this doesn't just occur in the ventricles, it occurs in the atria too. The instant you stretch the wall of the heart, you will stretch out these sarcomeres, you'll make them functional, and then you'll get this greater force of contraction. That will happen instantly, basically. Okay, the ANREP effect is an actual pathway which takes longer, basically. So, you have to have a longer period of stretch on the wall. But fundamentally, it is the same idea that stretch is going to go up. But generally, what will actually cause the ANREP effect to come into play? Well, let's talk about what might cause the ANREP effect to come into play. So, if aortic blood pressure was to go up, so this is the example that's often used. If aortic blood pressure went up, what would happen to the heart? So, blood pressure in the aorta has gone up. That's going to mean that this left ventricle is going to struggle. It's going to find it more difficult to push blood into the aorta because the aorta's blood pressure is, more, is higher. Okay, so the amount of blood that the heart is actually going to eject out on each beat is going to get lower, so the stroke volume is going to go lower. Okay, that's what you'd expect. Now, that is going to be, however, detrimental physiologically, because if stroke volume goes down, that means that the amount of blood that is actually going around the body um, is also going to go down, so the circulation is going to be reduced, basically. So you don't want this to happen, and the AMREP effect is going to help you in that regard. So, if aortic blood pressure goes down, the heart's going to struggle to eject blood, so it's going to eject a smaller amount of blood, okay? And if it ejects a smaller stroke volume, then more of the end diastolic volume, the blood that was in the ventricle at the very start of systole, um, more of that is going to stay within the heart, so the end systolic volume is going to go up, okay? then what will happen is the left atrium will pump another load of blood in, which will have the same volume as before, but now we've got a higher end systolic volume, so that's going to mean that the end diastolic volume, i.e. the end systolic volume plus the amount that the left atrium has ejected in, is going to be bigger. So gradually what's going to happen is you're going to swell up the left ventricle because it's going to gradually accumulate blood because it can't eject as much into the aorta, okay? So what you're going to do is increase the amount of blood in the atrium. You're going to increase the end diastolic volume again. So that will bring into play the frank Starling mechanism, it's okay, we've discussed that, but also this sort of a cause of this increased end diastolic volume is not going to be transient. If aortic blood pressure remains high for a long period of time, then the amount of blood in the left ventricle is going to be high for a long period of time, and that's the difference now. The Frank Starling mechanism, it could have just been a freak event. It could have just been that the left atrium suddenly happened to pump too much blood into the left ventricle, leading to end diastolic volume going up. Okay, but that was just a one-off event, and that employed the Frank Starling mechanism without the AMREP effect. Now, when we've got aortic blood pressure too high, what's going to happen is the end diastolic volume of the heart is going to go up, and it's not just going to go up transiently, it's going to go up for a long period of time, tens of fifteen, you know, a m minutes rather than just for seconds, basically. Okay, so when you have elevated end diastolic volume for a longer period of time, that's when you activate this AMREP effect. And it's basically a an effect on top of the Frank Starling mechanism. So we've already got the Frank Starling mechanism happening, but we're now going to increase the force with which our uh, cardiac muscle cells contract even more, basically. Uh, and this is going to be via the AMREP effect. So, fundamentally, what the AMREP effect is, 
is that when end diastolic volume goes up and remains up for a long period of time, you will recruit another mechanism besides the Frank Starling uh, mechanism to increase the force with which the cardiomyocytes contract. So the force is going to go up, and that's going to mean that we can increase our stroke volume. So basically, it's a protective mechanism to raise the stroke volume back up again if, for instance, aortic blood pressure was to go up. So if we increase the force with which these cardiomyocytes contract, then we can oppose this hugely high aortic blood pressure. And even though the aortic blood pressure is too high, we can still pump out uh, a, a large stroke volume. Okay, so that's what the AMREP effect is. It's a, a, an effect that's going to be recruited on top of the Starling mechanism, or the Frank Starling mechanism. So let me um, repeat, because it's worth repeating. If end diastolic volume goes up transiently, okay, so you just have a freak event, one heartbeat, the end diastolic volume is too high, that's going to recruit the Frank Starling mechanism instantly, and you'll get greater contractility and you'll eject a greater stroke volume. If, however, end diastolic volume is high continuously, then, yes, you'll recruit the, end, uh, the Frank Starling mechanism. How could you possibly not? The Frank Starling mechanism comes in as soon as you stretch the walls of the uh, heart. Okay, so you recruit the Frank Starling mechanism. That's trying its best to increase the contractility and increase the stroke volume. But you also recruit another mechanism known as the AMREP effect. Uh, on top of the Frank Starling mechanism, which is also going to make the cardiomyocytes contract more forcefully. Okay, so now let's look at the mechanism by which the AMREP effect occurs. And in order to look at the mechanism by which the AMREP effect occurs, we need to uh, discuss excitation contraction coupling within cardiomyocytes. Okay, right. So. And also, we need to discuss uh, the termination of the calcium signal as well. Right, okay. So, let's have a ventricular cardiomyocyte, because we have been discussing uh, the left ventricle in particular. So, here's our ventricular cardiomyocyte here. Now, ventricular myocytes have... Uh, T-tubules, whereas atrial cardiomyocytes do not. So we'll draw this T-tubule in here. Okay, right. So a T-tubule is called a transverse tubule because it's basically an invagination of the cell membrane that runs perpendicular to the plane that the cell membrane is actually in. Okay, so this is a T-tubule. Okay, so if you imagine having a balloon and sticking your finger into a balloon, that's exactly what this is like. It's like someone stuck their finger into the cell membrane and has produced this sort of uh, invagination of the cell membrane. That's what a T-tubule is like. And it's short for transverse tubule. Now, what's going to happen is when this uh, cardiomyocyte uh, gets an action potential, undergoes an action potential, then uh, the action potential is going to propagate along the membrane of the T-tubule, okay? And it's going to activate L-type voltage-gated calcium channels, which are within the membrane of this T-tubule. So let me draw one of these. Okay, so this is an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. And I just want to explain to you what it means to be an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. What does the L-type refer to? Okay, so voltage-gated calcium channels, or VGCCs for short, um, basically, they are not just one protein. They are a whole bunch of proteins stuck together. Okay, so um, basically, the most important protein within this complex of proteins that is the voltage-gated calcium channel is a subunit known as the alpha-1 subunit. So here I have drawn the alpha-1 subunit of the voltage-gated calcium channel. Now, the alpha-1 subunit is the portion that actually has the pore through which uh, ions can move. Okay, So it's the one through which the calcium ions actually move 
from the uh, extracellular fluid into the intracellular fluid. That's why I would say it's the most important of the subunits. So this is the alpha-1 subunit. Now, in the human genome, there is not just one gene coding for alpha-1 subunits of voltage-gated calcium channels. That would be very simple, but in fact, there's instead 10 genes in the human genome which code for alpha-1 subunits. And all of these genes have slightly different sequences of organic bases and therefore uh, lead to slightly different proteins being produced. So all of these alpha one, 10 alpha-1 subunits have slightly different uh, properties. Okay, so we can classify these 10 genes into families. So we classify them into three families. The first is called the CAV1 family, standing for voltage-gated calcium channel first family. The second is the CAV2 family, and finally there's the CAV3 family. So there are these three families of voltage-gated calcium channels. Now, we're not interested in this second and third family, um, but we are interested in this first family. So this first family contains four genes, the CAV1.1 gene, the CAV1.2 gene, the CAV1.3 gene, and also the CAV1.4 gene. So they're nice and sensibly named. So these are four separate genes which all code for alpha-1 subunits, okay? And if you use one of these four genes to code for the alpha-1 subunit of your voltage-gated calcium channel, i.e. if you use one of the four genes in the CAV1 family uh, to code for your alpha-1 subunit of your voltage-gated calcium channel, then your L, then your voltage-gated calcium channel will henceforth be known as an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. Okay, so that's what it means to be an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. It means that this alpha-1 subunit, which is the actual pore-forming unit of the voltage-gated calcium channel, was uh, made from one of these four genes. Okay. In addition, the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, well, all voltage-gated calcium channels, also have auxiliary subunits, okay? So I'll draw these in now. So these aren't utterly essential for the function, and indeed, you can make a functional voltage-gated calcium channel where you just have this alpha-1 subunit. However, these moderate its function, they target it to the right position, so they are quite important. So down here, you have the beta subunit in orange. Okay, so that's the beta subunit. Then, sitting alongside the alpha-1 subunit in the membrane here in green, you have the gamma subunit. Okay, and then finally, in turquoise over here, sitting alongside the alpha-1 subunit on the other side, you have the alpha-2 delta subunit. Okay, so this is alpha-2 delta. Okay, now, the um, reason this is known as the alpha-2 delta subunit is that it's really made up of two subunits. The alpha-2 subunit is this box at the top, and the delta subunit is the strand that straddles the membrane. Now, you might say, well, why is that not just counted as actually two subunits? Well, it's even more convoluted than that. Basically, both the alpha-2 and the delta subunit are encoded for by the same gene. So this one gene, the alpha-2 delta gene, makes a protein which has both the alpha-2 portion and the delta portion. That protein is then cleaved into two to make the alpha-2 and the delta protein, and then you join the alpha-2 and the delta back together uh, in a different way uh, to make the alpha-2 delta subunit. Okay, so that's the structure of this L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.